thanks for being here. Uh, thanks for having us. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to talk about uh, platform power and the political economy of social data. Uh, and I want to emphasize that this, this is very much a collaborative project. Uh, and I want from the University of Amsterdam to not be here. Uh, but you are very much in spirit and on the Twitters. Uh, and Fernando uh, from the University of Siegen. Uh, so all the great ideas are there, and all the crappy jokes are mine. So that's <laughs> what we agreed upon. Um, it's going to be very visual, um, so if you cannot see it or you want to see more of it, the slides uh, yeah, is online with the link slash data power 2017. And this is part of a work in progress paper uh, that's already out. Uh, you can download that as well. Uh, but maybe wait a reading after I'm done. Um, so what I'm going to talk about is then the partnership between uh, Facebook, particularly, uh, and the uh, industry partners in the market field um, round. I want to sort of start with an obvious observation how incredibly, let's just say, big uh, Facebook is. This is from the day before yesterday, the Wall Street Journal, nice infographic. Every new dollar, uh, at least in the US, uh, that is, I think this is North America and, and most part of Europe as well, uh, goes to either Google or Facebook, and then there are some sort of breadcrumbs uh, left behind. So Facebook and Google are obviously the main actors in the digital marketing ecosystem. Uh, they act as uh, data aggregators uh, and as marketing platforms. Um, so let's study them in depth. Right? Uh, Facebook is expanding. Uh, <coughs> about yesterday as well. They are probably having probably going to get soon. So that's going to be an interesting day when that happens. We're looking forward to how that's framed. Uh, in the paper and how it's going to work. So we're going to talk about that. Uh, but what these numbers hide, both the revenue and the, and the user, uh, user numbers, is sort of the deep economic and infrastructural integration of Facebook in the, uh, especially the marketing ecosystem. Uh, we want to Bill uh, on the, uh, the insights of Jose Van Dijk from uh, the University of Amsterdam. He positions this, uh, Facebook and the other platforms, in this ecosystem of uh, connective media. Uh, we want to sort of follow the money, follow the data, um, such yeah. um, uh, through uh, looking at how these relationships between these platforms, Facebook and Google, but particularly Facebook, expands through these partnerships with third parties uh, in the advertising ecosystem. Um, we want to contribute to the literature and the, the insights that are already there by this uh, partnership dynamics. Right? The, the partnerships are coming and going. How can we investigate them? Uh, they grow, they're catering to a growing number of uh, uh, partners, and each have very distinct interests in the, the marketing realm. Um, it seems obvious, but sort of also very much a question that Facebook is increasingly entrenched uh, in this uh, ecosystem and this ecosystem is changing so fast. So is Facebook being entrenched? Are they the dominant player or not? What does that mean? Uh, so the fourth point is we want to take critical political economic approach. We're very much interested in issues of power and equity and equality to see uh, how Facebook not only treats its users but also very much its, uh, its partners. Uh, Previous work in this realm on digital advertising, digital marketing, particularly in media studies, focused primarily or mostly on privacy and surveillance and discrimination. Uh, Joe Gross' work is, stands out in this respect. Uh, we're not going to touch that that much. Uh, so that's part of what we build on. And the other part is then the critical political economic part. Uh, most of that um, uh, seems to focus on this sort of Marxist or neo-Marxist of building on the Dallas White's work of, of the audience commodity. Um, part of that is uh, helpful and insightful, but uh, there's some challenges with that. Not all of that work is very empirical, uh, I would argue, but we can debate that later. Um, what we want to do is sort of give that an institutional twist and really dig into, like, okay, how is uh, power operationalized? And not only look at the audience and the audience commodity, but also these intra uh, industry relationships. Right? So, that's what Jose Van Dijk has been doing in her book uh, and her future work, is in relationship between platforms, governance, and these business models. And she argues in her book, uh, in the PC economy of Silicon Valley, these partnership deals, even with competitors, 
uh, are as important as the, the competition. Right? So you can you can debate how much, uh, to what extent are Facebook and Google competitors. Uh, Facebook apps are on Apple's uh, platform, on Android and such. So are they truly competitors or how should we frame them? So this leads us to our uh, empirical investigation. We started with Facebook marketing partners .com. And if you go there now, you can see the list of current partners. And they're quite a lot. Uh, they're very uh, different, uh, different kinds of partners with different roles. Um, uh, and what, what is immediately apparent if you talk to them, um, to these partners, and as well if you go to this list, is this whole sense of uh, this mutual beneficial relationship between Facebook and its partners. Everybody seems to be very. Um, the second part that is uh, fascinating to see is that uh, most of these partners add expertise to Facebook's role. Right? So they do, for example, localization. There are advertising partners in Japan that can offer services and expertise that Facebook cannot or don't want to uh, do. Um, what we wanted to do is to see how these relationships between these third parties are sort of forged. Uh, sustain and then terminate the program. Right, so if you become a Facebook partner, what does that mean? How does that work? Uh, our approach is a mixed method approach. We did two things. Uh, on the one hand, we did sort of this digital historical methods approach, explored by Richard Rogers in his book, and his work in Amsterdam as a digital methods initiative to reconstruct these partnerships all the time because we want to see how this is changing. And we did most of that through the internet archive or the way back machine. Um, but that only gets you so far. So what we also did is uh, a number of uh, background interviews, uh, semi-structured interviews, with these Facebook partners, like Adjust, uh, Any, AppSlyer, Fixu, GrowMobile. And they, these are mostly in either Europe uh, or in the US. Uh, uh, just I think, it's German, and then it's French, slash European, Fixu is in Boston. Uh, so these, these companies give a lot of flavor because once you start talking to them, they're very happy about, you know, we're a Facebook partner, they seem to be sort of proud of that in a certain way, but when you sort of start to puncture a little bit, then it's like, yeah, you know, we, we all know what happened in June, they got kicked off the platform and their business cratered, so, you know, there's the sort of, I wouldn't say mafia-style behavior, but sometimes it seems like nice platform you got there. Shame or something happened. That's how I feel. Every time I see Zuckerberg, I can see his Anyway, sorry. These are the crappy jokes, so. Um, let's, let's dig into the, the result of our investigation, right? Uh, what we did is we looked through the Internet Wayback Machine at these uh, official sources. So, company blogs, company blog archives, project and developer documentation pages, uh, tech blogs, and all these. This so it's very much deep, deep archival work and digging deep into the uh, wormhole, going into the wormhole. Um, you see it's starting, I hope it, 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 it's a bit readable. It started there like 2008, 2009 with the preferred development consultant program. And these, these uh, rounds, that's what the official sources would say. And you see sort of an evolution of these part, partner programs up until here. So there's an existing program, and then it segues into what it is uh, today. So this is where we are today. And then these new programs are all related to new Facebook products. Uh, increasingly popular, like Instagram is sort of new in the Facebook family, uh, Atlas, Audience Network. So these are the uh, Facebook partner programs, particularly folks on the web. And then you have all these new uh, products, Facebook calls it products. Which is incredibly confusing because sometimes groups is a product and Instagram is a product, so it's, it's a weird state. I don't understand why they do it like that, but it's hard to get a sense of why, why they're making those kinds of decisions. Anyway, um, this is how the uh, 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 platform or the, uh, the partnerships evolve. Uh, another way to visualize this is what we've done is to look at badges. And these badges are ways for these partners to show to others. Uh, on their website, what their relationship status is, sort of with Facebook. It's complicated. Um, so on the left, you see it started with areas of expertise, which is very generic. Right? And then soon they found a way to sort of frame it differently, institutionalize it differently. Uh, preferred developer content, uh, preferred development consultant, or something like that. They use the same words all the time, it's very confusing. Um, and then these partners 
start to use sort of uh, labels themselves. So you see an endless list, they are preferred developed consultant in games or something, something. Then at some point, Facebook said 2012, okay, we're going to frame this differently. You're going to be a preferred uh, developer consultant. Cool. Uh, it's called a uh, preferred marketing developer, obviously. Right? <laughs> um, you, can be, uh, you can be that. Um, in terms of qualifications, pages, ads. So this evolves. So here you see this middle segment of user expertise. And today, sort of more recently, they segue that or mark that into marketing uh, partners. First, they had these, you know, not that nice graphics, and they didn't do sort of practical, but they didn't think they did a course, and it's the same. So the takeaway here, other than this being sort of semi fancy graphics, um, is an increasing professionalization of these more generic digital marketing practices. So instead of this hardcore digital ecosystem block and framing, you have more, more of a broader range of more traditional marketing activities. Right? So this is how these historically these part, this partner programs evolved. So this is the first half of our investigation. And the second half is so who are these partners and how did those partnerships evolve? Um, so here's the whole list. We took 10 points in time from 2010 to sort of very recently, uh, using again the Internet Archive. Um, this is only 25% of it, but again, you can download it there and then dig into if you can't sleep or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> dig into this. Um, uh, it would be a nice poster uh, for your dorm room as well. I guess. <laughs> <laughs> if the nerd is big and not being huge. Um, so, this list consists of uh, 565 unique partners. Uh, so over time, uh, Facebook has more than 560 uh, unique partners. But what is uh, in, uh, what, what strikes uh, what, what, uh, is apparent is that 20% uh, are consistent partners. 20% of those 500, so like around 100, they, they start at the beginning and they're still sort of with Facebook. And below that are companies coming and going, which, is, which kind of surprised us. Uh, so you have uh, under partners like Brand Networks, here say Systems, Social Bakers that have been with Facebook from the beginning, but below that is constantly changing. Another way to visualize that is this. Uh, the partner developer or the development consultant part. I hope I say it correctly. That's there and started. The blue bars are continuations and the light blue bars are additions. And the red bars are obviously uh, determinations. So you have the uh, preferred marketing developer program and then you have the Facebook marketing partners program. And here what you see, I hope it's becoming more and more clear, you see sort of a entrenchment. You see sort of a uh, stabilization of, uh, of the ecosystem where there is a continuation, less deletions, less. So here, this is close to where we are today. You have 150 partners, uh, many of which are more traditional, I would say, traditional uh, uh, partners. So to wrap this up, what we took away from this, and again, this is work in progress, so any kind of input and in comment are very welcome on this. Uh, what we saw is an establishing of a variety of uh, marketing partner programs, right? You have these preferred developer something, blah, blah, blah. Uh, and then in 2012, it was sort of the streamlining of these partner programs in, sort of in the unified program. And then starting in 2015, we saw these partner programs associated with new platform features. So on Instagram, you have new programs, uh, probably for WhatsApp in the future, that's very likely. Uh, yesterday it was announced that Groups is going to be the new thing for Facebook, right? Groups is going to be a new app and has to have a billion users so you can monetize it. A lot of it. Uh, so that prom groups will all have also pro very likely have a very similar uh, partner program with that system. Uh, and another acronym I will obviously forget. Is. So, the concluding slide is um, uh, we think examining Facebook uh, expansion is important, not only as a, as a website and its family of apps, its app suite, but also how the platform evolves beyond ports, right? It's the economic and infrastructural transfer. That is, takes place not only on a business level, but also on a computational level, what you do um, And that takes place through these partners. And these partnerships are sometimes uh, coming and going, but there's also an transfer. 
And the second part is to we want to understand the political economy course, uh, of this. What we're seeing is sort of bad dependencies, uh, where third parties are becoming directly or indirectly dependent, very much dependent. And then Facebook decides, for whatever reason, to cut off the data house these partners uh, have nation. Um, and finally, if we want to understand this really outside role Facebook has in this ecosystem, uh, we need to look at these uh, social data streams. Thank you very much. So I'd like to begin with a simple question. What constitutes infrastructure, information infrastructure? The answers are diverse depending on the phenomena one prioritizes, yet it is typical to distinguish between approaches that emphasize infrastructure as substrate, the large technical systems that we inevitably rely upon, and infrastructure as relational, that processual accomplishment that encompasses a wider range of embodied and materialist elements that systems-oriented approaches usually permit. Our paper proposes a more peculiar answer. Problems are constitutive of infrastructure. We will pursue this odd idea by canvassing the rich history of network and infrastructural analysis for its conception and description of problem resolution, by retconning it via philosophical pragmatism, and by discussing some contemporary developments in information processing that necessitate the theoretical sensibility suggested by our approach. Now, it is the site of our research, uh, a two-year study of software writing for quantum computers, that encourages us to reconfigure the usual divisions of network and infrastructure scholarship by emphasizing the posing and resolving of problems. You have heard of quantum computing before, perhaps. Uh, it is widely celebrated and occasionally feared as promising an exotic, paradigm-shifting mode of information processing. And it is often considered an emblematic instance of disruptive technology. And the differences between quantum and the digital computing are usually emphasized in these discussions. Our account is a little more measured. Uh, it looks at how hybrid relationships were developed be between digital and computing, quantum computing in the case of what's called adiabatic quantum computing, or AQC, and describes how obstacles to the programming of quantum computers were overcome by reconceiving software design on a different model of problem resolution. One such obstacle, obstacle, the very distinction between quantum and digital computing, was transcended when a different approach to problem resolution reshaped how previously entrenched technical distinctions had circumscribed work practices. It is by adopting a different style of problem resolution gradually abstracted from a specific domain that marked its inception, that quantum computing programmers could access a wider array of institutional sites and extend their own infrastructure. In our view, this description of problem resolution has wider implications for contemporary discussions of networks, power, and control, many of which are dominated by an algorithmic imaginary that has internalized the technical and institutional workings of universal digital machines when conceptualizing information processing and computation generally. Now, it is fair to suggest that quantum computing disrupts. It undermines the universal scope of the digital over the entire domain of computation. Yet, in our account, the digital and quantum computers are not differentiated primarily in terms of ones and zeros, physical principles, uh, material substrates, or even math, but in terms of the problems that they address, or better, the kinds of problems and their formulations these machines encourage and permit us to do. Our wager is that the problem resolution dynamics observable at the inception of a new mode of information processing are of wider relevance, not just because AQC will necessarily dominate the computational landscape or liberate us from the various forms of control, but because we might now recast information processing more widely with problem resolution rather than technical or algorithmic response or sensibilities. Or put another way, we might situate technical and algorithmic approaches with respect to the problem resolution capabilities they afford or make them possible. Or still another way, computation is problem dependent. It is on this terrain that a politics of computing, digital and quantum, might be reconfigured. So first, a quick summary of our synthesis of the main lines of network and infrastructural theory, as this literature touches on the question of problem resolution. And we cannot share the full history, synthesis, or even a topology of problem resolution, given time constraints, though I'm sure you'd love that. But we will try to sensitize you to our way of thinking a little bit. Second, uh, we'll describe the results of research conducted on the programming of quantum computing by one of the, by one of the authors before hinting at a few implications of our work for network and infrastructural analysis on information processing more broadly. So there are several ways to differentiate the literature on networks and infrastructure. 
it is typical in the history of science and technology studies to distinguish active network theory and the social construction of technology and large technological systems in terms of its emphasis on non-human agency. It is more typical of media scholarship, however, to turn away from the LTS approach inspired by Thomas Hughes by emphasizing phenomenological and materialist frameworks for infrastructure. In this respect, Hughes' work is critiqued less for its humanism than its emphasis on a particular sort of infrastructure and for entrenching an overly reductive model of technological evolution. In their collection on media infrastructure, for instance, Parks and Storcielski distinguish their materialist approach from Hughes' work in these terms, and John Durham Peters offers a similar justification for situating infrastructural scholarship with respect to the legacy of phenomenology. Now, the upshot to that approach is often an emphasis on the visibility of infrastructure to embodied humans and a privileging of disruption and failure and breakdown as conditions that disclose our dependency on its operations, a tendency that Peters usually, usefully traces to the breaching experiments pioneered by Garfinkel's ethnomethodological work. Now, we are less interested in reproducing these divisions in the literature than in rating its classical and contemporary works in SDS, media theory, information, library science, wherever, really, for their approaches to problem resolution. Our goal in doing so is first, to gain the resources to explain what we saw in quantum computing development, and second, to situate accounts of information and data processing within a more flexible account of problem resolution by constantly network and infrastructure literatures around this purpose. In this regard, we hope to dislodge the priority of disruption in thinking about digital computing and technological development. Now, in a better world, one in which we had an hour instead of 15 minutes, we would sensitize you to our way of thinking by distinguishing some iconic problem formulations, like crisis problems, critical problems, common problems, reverse setting problems, sweet problems, uh, as these are conceptualized in classic works of network and infrastructural theory. But we have at the time, and kind of wouldn't you, oh, yeah, that's like, and wouldn't you rather hear a little more about quantum computing anyway? It's a little more fun. Now, if you've heard of quantum computing, you probably know that it's something to do with simultaneous ones and zeros, quantum bits, and is related to physics concepts like superposition and entanglement. Or perhaps you just have a general impression of its strangeness and supposed superiority. Now, I'm happy to talk at length about these things, uh, but for today what I want to kind of draw attention to is how that many different materials, architectures, and capabilities are being right now called quantum computing. And to understand them and how they are restructuring computation infrastructure, it helps to follow the problems guiding their development. So several specialized quantum processors exist today. Uh, here we see some from IBM and D-Way from systems. And these are the kind of glamour shots you often see circulate at the systems. The outside of them are far more boring. Um, for today's discussion, we were focusing on this one on the left here, or my, that way, <laughs> on D-Way's Vesuvius model, and work done with its software developer, OneCubit. Now this computer forgoes the basic strength of a Turing machine, that computers can supposedly be programmed to solve any type of problem. Instead, it uses qubits that are connected in such a way that they can be described as an IZ model or its equivalent expression mathematically as a cubo. Now, this is the native problem to the architecture of these computers. To solve this category of problem, qubits are put through an energetic physical process as opposed to the logic process of a typical digital computer. This makes quantum computing a form of analog computation, deploying a natural phenomena so it can solve some optimization problems. And that is all they can solve any other problem must be translated into this form for them to be of any use at all. Now, while this type of optimization problem has many applications, programming in, in, into the computers is not always possible. The search for practical real-life applications that the computer can solve is deeply coupled to its basic research and development. Companies and methodologies compete to produce the holy grail of a practical quantum paradigm. Proving the validity of this approach has been deeply associated in the industry and academic community was showing it could solve impressive real-life problems. Now, many early critics of these processors were both skeptical as to whether it was really quantum, and this was highly tied to showing not just basic computational abilities, but advantageous computational results compared to the digital. This meant that the researchers working on it had to show this kind of computer could be programmed to do the kind of work that made it worth developing. So in an early project, one qubit aimed to bridge the mathematical descriptions of two objects an option trading portfolio, and a 512 qubit processor. Now, the, the work here, their work here is less strictly about software design and more the creation of a new problematic, one that can bridge the existing known problems of the financial sector and the machine. Now, the team at OneQubit working on this included a range of expertise, mathematicians, physicists, engineers, finance experts, all of whom began with little experience in quantum computing specifically, but who firmly believed that the math and models of AQC 
could supplant digital computing optimization methods. After all, since the earliest visions of quantum computing, they have offered the prospect of true answers to optimization and modeling problems, as opposed to digital computers, where their discrete operations only producing very good, but not actually optimal answers to hard optimizations. Now, this belief led to many missteps, as well as unexpected technical infrastructure. Now, an initial approach was to take a well-known mathematical model of the market used in the area of finance, called the Black-Scholes model, and transform it into formulas that could be compatible with a Cubo, uh, in the Cubo format. Now, yesterday there was a great presentation on the mythology surrounding the Black Shoals and its performative role in quantitative finance and options trading, which I won't get into here, but it's a really good story. Uh, a Black Shoals is already a format for kinds of optimization. So solving the two is, so making the two align is plausible, even if they do not convert precisely. Solving a large portfolio optimization with the model and the quantum computer would have less, would have likely interested many investment groups and potentially been a value generating tool even as a demo. Now for several months, when Qubit tried to find a way to make the known problem addressed by Black-Scholes uh, and find a way to fit it onto that quantum architecture, there, this problem type is exactly what this uh, specialized type of quantum computing is supposed to be good at. It would have been a great accomplishment. So here's a few reasons why that didn't happen. Now for one, this model does not actually reflect the Black-Scholes model, the assumptions and practices of those who do real life trading. So for example, one Qubit's finance experts explained that Unlike its depiction as a formula, aspects like interest rates and volatility are not expected to act as constants by practitioners. Traders regularly manipulate the math to make it work in daily practice. And this makes staying true to Black-Scholes seem less important over time for the researchers in quantum computing. Secondly, a portfolio simply has too many variables in the current size of quantum processor for it to represent. Fulfilling their vision of finding a quantum solution to upend the current digital paradigm is not going to work using other techniques that could also be theoretically improved with a pure quantum approach, such as binomial decision trees or other theoretical approaches, ran into similar problems. However, the researchers quickly considered toy problems. So through a series of concessions away from the annoying complexity of real life market behavior, one qubit suggested and iteratively tested whether it was possible to model a simplified portfolio optimization without the full load of constraints and variables. Now having lost the expectation that the quantum processor could currently solve the full problem, they propose to run it not as a single problem on the quantum computer, but as a series of smaller problems broken apart. When these problems were broken apart in a certain way through many iterations of software, it also became clear that parts of the problem were still better handled by digital computers. So they arrived at a hybrid back and forth computation model, as is in the optimism around this model fitting this problem. Um, So letting each computer handle its area of expertise and exchange finished chunks in the overall solution. Now to get there, the idea that the quantum or digital was wholly superior had to be abandoned. And additionally, this made sense as a compromise to try to show that this particular portfolio problem could to a degree be tackled using the quantum computer with the premise being that a larger processor later on would one day be able to process the entire problem. However, once this was established as a method, the idea of a hybrid quantum digital computational system became a more real reference point than for further development than the idea of a future ship. The team was able to spend the next few months programming and benchmarking the results of the pseudo solution, but with several of the researchers were not able to do, uh, which several researchers were not able to do with the project. Even with the reworking of the options trading problem into this divided hybrid model, it was not sure whether the researchers were, was they were still left with a problematic solution that had no real world applicability. It's not something a quantitative finance expert would ever use, and its results could not improve upon the state of the art. But does the problematic even have to be an improvement or even work? Not at least by the standards of the finance industry. Despite being industry-driven applied research, effectiveness was not the ultimate measure of success. The notion was to create a relationship through a problematic, not a solution for a current portfolio. And this can be seen in how developing the simplified portfolio optimization ultimately worked based on a computational compromise rather than the intention of demonstrating an entirely new quantum paradigm. It ultimately led to a hybrid quantum digital problematic that demonstrated how the exotic processor could be connected to digital computational infrastructure. The software that spun out from this project laid the foundation for techniques, uh, software packages, and programming methodologies that expanded the quantum system into new areas and with more support. With the production of new solvable problems tied together with disparate technologies, software development became a negotiation point at which a problematic is formulated and then acts to shape and grow the network of quantum computing. This is very reminiscent of Hughes' description of technical networks being solutions looking for problems. 
Now, navigating and analyzing problem resolution like this brings together often seemingly disparate layers of analysis, which is coding, algorithm design, fabrication, and application, only some of which we touched on today. So in conclusion, our broader goal is to make infrastructure work more responsive to new sorts of information processing, to challenge its digital and internet imaginary with respect to information processing, and to emphasize a rather different stage in infrastructural dynamics, which, if accorded more significance, will let us set, up, set aside the strong contrast between normal functioning and disruptive breakdown. In closing, this admittedly usual, unusual example permits us to systematize and emphasize the problematological dynamic found in classical works of infrastructural theory, and because of that, we decided to follow the problem rather than follow the actors, or rather to treat the problem as an actor. And this provides a view of quantum computing that doesn't rely on an account of disruptive technology although this is clearly the image used to generate investment from venture capitalists and popular interests. But up now it's a little clear what we mean by to suggest that problems are constitutive of infrastructure, unsolved, they motivate the creation of new technological systems, and as developers tackle them, they lead to unexpected methods and operations that shape the character of a growing infrastructure. Later, these specific problems may recede from view, but they establish a logic and growth, passing on particular strengths and weaknesses that whatever future algorithms are run on the system must take into account. Thanks very much. All right. Um, thank you. I, I'm mm -hmm. um, so this is my usual disclaimer, and I always start with the disclaimer because I'm from the last faculty of law, and that's how we do things. Um, <laughs> I'm from, so my disclaimer is I'm from the faculty of law. <laughs> and so I'm not a data scientist, and uh, so you have to uh, understand my presentation in that context. Um, I have been, over the last year, working on issues around um, the platform economy, and in particular, um, uh, this presentation is going to be talking a little bit about the data, data ecosystem uh, of uh, Airbnb. My research interest is uh, fundamentally in uh, the area of ownership and control over data. I'm really interested in, in a, a variety of issues relating to ownership, rights of ownership, and rights to control data um, in the information society. And so I've done a lot of work, uh, including with Tracy, on uh, open data, uh, which is an aspect of that. And in this uh, sort of phase of my work, I've been looking at uh, data in the hands of the private sector. And I'm increasingly concerned about the, uh, the growing concentration of a lot of really important data in the hands of the private sector, uh, combined with a legal regime that has traditionally provided strong protection for private sector data assets, because data in the hands of the private sector is seen as assets in the hands of the public sector. It's at least in theory seen as something to which people have a right of access on the freedom of information and, and so on, and other sorts of laws. Uh, but in the hands of the private sector, it's seen as uh, commercial assets. Um, so my broader research question is, how do we ensure access to data and a right to use it in the public interest when it's in private sector hands? Uh, and so this research fits in to that context. Um, I've been looking at platform companies, because they collect huge amounts of data. Uh, there are lots of reasons why I've looked at them, but that's one of them. Um, and in the context of platform companies, they have both um, publicly accessible data. You think about all of the, the information that's available on Facebook. Facebook or Airbnb and so on. And they also have private and commercial, uh, private and confidential uh, commercial data. Both categories of data are important. Uh, there are transparency and access issues that are relevant in both contexts. Um, uh, and both are of research interest to me, but my focus in this presentation is going to be on uh, publicly accessible data. Um, so platform companies, and why am I interested in platform companies? They collect vast amounts of data, as I mentioned. Uh, another reason to be that I'm interested in them is they often disrupt uh, incumbent uh, regulated industries, the taxi industry, uh, the hotel or, or short-term accommoda accommodation industry, uh, and as a result, they can have very significant impacts in local communities. Um, they, they affect uh, the labor market, they affect the short-term rental market, they have these uh, often very dramatic impacts. And they give rise to tension between the role of government uh, in that context the, and the obligation of government to, to especially local municipal governments to, to manage what's going on within uh, uh, their communities um, and the uh, commercial economic rights of the private sector company. They also operate in the cloud, which makes them difficult to regulate, particularly when it comes to data and information, uh, because the data and the information is located uh, in the cloud. 
Uh, my particular research focus has been on Airbnb. Uh, Airbnb, of course, is hugely disruptive of um, uh, local communities in terms of attention to in short-term uh, and long-term rental. Um, there's, um, in fact, let me just, uh, I have some very, very basic slides, so um, that is attached to my earlier disclaimer. You can't even read them, but these are just uh, examples of uh, smattering of uh, newspaper articles uh, that talk about the impact of Airbnb in local communities. Uh, people are being forced out of their uh, accommodation because the owners of the buildings want to turn it into short-term rentals through Airbnb. Uh, there are people who, uh, you know, uh, there's a shortage of long-term accommodation, but short-term accommodation is being converted to Airbnb rentals. Uh, it's driving up the price of rents and so on. Okay. So, uh, so this is one of the reasons I'm interested in it. Um, a lot of Airbnb data is publicly accessible. So from the, the portion of my research that looks at publicly accessible data, that makes Airbnb particularly interesting. In order to function uh, as, as the kind of platform company they are, they have to hang a lot of their data out in public uh, because uh, hosts have to be able to show what they have to rent and, and guests have to be able to find uh, those rentals. So there's a tremendous amount of uh, uh, data that is actually publicly accessible as compared to a company like Uber where more of its data is uh, uh, confidential to the company. Um, and the other thing that really interests me about Airbnb data is that there's this tremendous ecosystem that's grown up around Airbnb data, and I'm going to talk about that in more detail uh, in a second. So my very specific research questions are um, where data is publicly accessible, what are the means used by these companies to control uh, or limit access to and use of that data? Um, and how do our information law regimes uh, support these controls? What is it in our legal systems that actually support and, 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 and bolster the attempts of these platform companies to control and limit access to uh, the publicly accessible data? Um, and then my next question, of course, is what exceptions or limitations on rights of control and ownership are required in order to ensure the ability to reuse this data in the public interest? Um, and so that's, in a nutshell, what I've uh, been looking at. So I'll talk a little bit about the uh, Airbnb data ecosystem. Very, really crude slides, but <laughs> law, right? <laughs> um, so you have all this uh, data that's out on the Airbnb platform, and you have all kinds of people who have who are out there, mostly scraping, not exclusively, <coughs> but mostly scraping data from Airbnb. So you have civil society actors, and there's some really interesting, really good civil society actors in this sector who are going out and scraping Airbnb data. Uh, in order to figure out what's going on in particular cities and who make it available online. So there's Inside Airbnb. Um, uh, in particular, there's uh, Tom Slee and Murray Cox, who are a couple of activists who have been scraping a lot of data and sharing those data sets and also doing their own data anal visual analytics, making a lot of information about Airbnb and its impacts publicly available and publicly accessible. Uh, so there's a very strong civil society community around Airbnb data. There are academic and other researchers who have been scraping Airbnb data also to do to write in a variety of different disciplines about the impact of Airbnb, what's happening with Airbnb, so you've got urban planners, uh, you have uh, 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 people in all, all sorts of different uh, disciplines who have been scraping Airbnb data in order to carry out research. You've got journalists who have been scraping Airbnb data um, in order to figure out what's going on in particular communities or cities, or they've been relying on scrape data from companies. And I've got opportun opportunistic businesses here. There are companies, um, and the consultants could have been included in that, who scrape uh, Airbnb data on behalf of customers or clients, whether they're journalists or municipal governments, because municipal governments have also been relying on scrape data. They haven't been scraping it themselves, but they've been hiring consultants um, uh, in order to scrape the data for them in order to try and understand what's happening on Airbnb. And then you have a, a whole other category of really, I think it's really quite interesting, of opportunistic businesses uh, that are scraping uh, Airbnb data in order to, um, uh, some of them provide analytic services to people who want to rent on Airbnb. So uh, they, they do analytics and they, they help people uh, uh, understand how to price their units and uh, how to vary the price over uh, over the year for that type of unit in that type of city, in that particular city. Um, and uh, you have uh, detective agencies that are helping condo boards and, and, and landlords uh, detect people who are, I mean, there's just a, a ton of businesses that are also accessing Airbnb data 
you know, and, and, and building the whole business model around Airbnb data, I think that's an interesting category in terms of when you think about the public interest in this publicly accessible data, uh, because uh, it, innovation is supposed to be one of the things that government is pursuing with all of its policies, including intellectual property policies. Here's a bunch of companies and businesses that are springing up uh, and, and using uh, illegally scrape data in order to build their business model. Anyway. So I'm going to put that up there as well. So it's a really interesting data ecosystem. You've got all this publicly accessible data. You've got all these people who are scraping it and using it for a variety of different reasons, uh, many of them uh, in the public interest. So how does Airbnb try to control or limit or constrain how uh, the data that is <coughs> put out there on their website is used? Well, they have terms of service. They have very lengthy terms of services, terms of service, in which they prohibit all kinds of things. Essentially. Uh, they, the basis for the protection of their compilation, their overall compilation of data is copyright law, and they argue that, that their content is uh, protected by copyright law, and they give you in the terms of service a license to access and view the data, but not to do anything else with it. Not to copy it, not to download it, not to do anything else to access and view. That is what you as a user are allowed to do. And then they get into specifics, and they say, there is to be no scraping or harvesting of data from the site, whether manually or by automation. Uh, and that's backed up, of course, by copyright law, because they could argue that to do so would be copyright infringement, by contract law, because if you scrape, you're breaching your terms of service, which is a binding contract. Um, just this morning, the Supreme Court of Canada released a decision uh, which uh, deals with um, end user license agreements on websites. So super interesting decision, and, and I'll have to be uh, working that in. They could have done that yesterday, but they, they didn't ask. Me. I didn't want to put too much pressure. Um, so, uh, so they've got contract law. Some courts, particularly in the United States, have seen arguments about trespass to chattels, that when somebody's going on and, and harvesting stuff from a computer service, they're actually trespassing on, uh, on the server. Um, that's why I put a question mark. Uh, they also say there's no right to copy, access, or use data for purposes that are not expressly permitted. The permitted purposes are um, uh, accessing and viewing. Uh, that's bolstered by copyright law and contract law. You're not allowed to circumvent technological <coughs> protection measures. They say that specifically. Our government in 2012 passed amendments to the Copyright Act um, giving extremely broad protection for technical technological protection measures. And no circumvention of them, uh, even for fair dealing purposes. Uh, so to the extent that there are TPMs protecting the data, we now have a law that makes it you know, really problematic. There's not a fair dealing excuse you could muster uh, to breach uh, those technological protection measures in order to access and use the data. So it's backed up by contract law and the contract law again. Um, and there's no creation of derivative works, no distribution, licensing, or sale of content. And of course, all of those opportunistic businesses and consultants and so on are doing precisely that. Uh, and so are the so are the um, uh, civil society actors, right? Because they're creating um, visual analytics and distributing data sets, and that's backed up by contract and copyright law. So there's a whole bunch of law that says you can't do any of these things uh, that people are now doing, um, and that serve the public interest to a very significant extent. If you look at what's going on with uh, municipalities and Airbnb, I mean, there's a tremendous reliance on the part of municipalities on scraped data simply because it's very difficult to access uh, data otherwise, and the data that is sometimes um, provided by Airbnb uh, is uh, open to challenge. Um, so uh, in terms of, um, and I'm running out of time, so I'll just very briefly give you a sense of where I'm going with all of this. Um, I'm looking at you know, where you can find the exceptions, where you can find the leeway uh, in the laws in order to address some of the, uh, the, the, the bodies of law. And so my argument is basically that courts have to start thinking about the public interest more broadly when they're interpreting copyright law and applying copyright law in these contexts, when they're uh, interpreting and applying the anti-circumvention <coughs> provisions. We've just had a couple of decisions uh, from the Canadian courts that are quite horrendous in terms of how they are so uh, willing to interpret these uh, uh, technological protection measures to, to, to protect absolutely um, uh, technological protection measures um, uh, and how they have to approach the enforceability of contracting. Of course, the Supreme Court of Canada seems to have done something very interesting in that regard as well. Um, and so I'm looking at those sorts of issues 
to see how you can build an argument for the interpretation of the law in this context when you're dealing with publicly accessible platform data so that we start to develop um, uh, exceptions, interpretations that serve the public interest and that can allow and continue to allow access to this type of uh, information in the public interest. And so you might be sitting there thinking, um, that's all very well and good, but if everybody's scraping this data and using it and nobody's getting sued, why are you bothering? <laughs> okay. um, and here's why I think it's important notwithstanding. The legal intimidation, the potential for legal intimidation, and I have seen it in a whole range of different contexts, combined with the disparity in economic power, uh, can easily suppress uses or activity unless there are clear rights to access and use. So it just takes, if you are a civil society activist or a researcher, you get a cease and desist letter from Airbnb, <coughs> you are going to cease and desist. Or you're going to uh, put another mortgage on your house and you're it. Because you don't have the resources to fight that kind of thing. And so the fact that that power can be exercised and can easily be exercised simply through a letter, doesn't even have to go to court, is a problem. That's why we need clear public interest exceptions. People have to have some sense of comfort that the law is there to support their activities. The other thing, and I see this happening too, is that the apparent illegality or illicitness of scraping data, contrary to copyright law, contrary <coughs> to terms of use, can have an impact on research ethics decisions with respect to researchers, thus mm -hmm. chilling use. Mm -hmm. You say to your research ethics board, I'm going to scrape data contrary to the contractual terms of service to which I'm bound when I go onto the website, and they're gonna say, is that ethical? Right? Um, and, um, and, and then thirdly, I think this is part of a larger need to rethink rules uh, around access to, uh, uh, access to and use of information in the hands of the private sector. So this is a piece that's looking at publicly accessible data, but I think we're in a context now um, where it is becoming really significantly important that so much data is being collected by the private sector that you have governments that, that are now for planning um, and, and all sorts of uh, purposes uh, willing to uh, uh, purchase data from the private sector and use purchase data to stop collecting it themselves, to rely on data in the hands of the private sector, <coughs> Uh, to contract for, in smart cities, for example, data and analytics from the private sector, leaving ownership in the hands of the private sector, then unless we have a clear information law framework for how we are going to be able to access and use that data in the public interest, we're going to be in serious trouble. So that's it in a nutshell. Thanks very much. All right, so uh, I'm Ashley Mellenbacher, and uh, this is this talk's based on a uh, manuscript I've written with Brad Mellenbacher, so that's why he's on here as uh, co-authors, and we're working on this together. Um, and so for some of the context, what I'm really interested in talking about fits quite nicely with what we've heard today already, so I'm going to, for the sake of time, skim some of the uh, background theory that we've really already got a sense of with uh, uh, the previous talks, but right now there's this sort of moment where citizen scientists who are uh, basically everyday people who are interested in participating in scientific research, even if they don't have expertise, begin to participate in projects. We sort of see two kinds of this top down, where a scientist or researcher says, come work with me, collect data with me, we're going to analyze data. Um, and the kind where a citizen says, there's a problem I want to address, scientists won't help me for some reason, uh, we're going to do it, or something like Flint, Michigan, right? There's a problem, people are ignoring it, we're going to bring in a network of experts and try to really get this done. So uh, what I want to talk about a bit is the kind of commons, the data commons that citizen scientists are creating. And commons is this idea, which I'll uh, come back to briefly in a moment, but basically shared resources, right? And I think some of this is happening through, uh, I think uh, infrastructure is a useful metaphor to think about this. So that's kind of how I'm talking about citizen science as this kind of culmination of a bunch of things that form this kind of information infrastructure. So we'll see it's not really a discourse community or a, a network in the kinds of ways we would traditionally conceptualize those. Um, so what's at stake? Well, you know, these issues of who owns data, who has access to data, and when we think about environmental consequences, this becomes really important. So the commons, uh, basically, as I said, shared resource. If you kind of know what it is or have heard of it occasionally, it's probably <coughs> Hardin's tragedy of the commons, right, where he says, 
you give a bunch of people, say, this beautiful pastoral land, um, and people start using it, and you say, okay, you can have, you know, two sheep each. Someone's going to come along and say, I want a third, eventually destroying the sustainability. So lots of commentaries said, um, you know, that's probably a little critical on human nature and how these things actually seem to work. I won't get into that, but if you're on the more pessimistic, pessimistic or optimistic side, you can kind of pick your argument to follow that if you find it interesting. Information infrastructure is pretty much following what we've already talked about today, but this idea, you know, it's not just stuff you can kick, right? It's also these kinds of abstractions, and I think it's a very useful metaphor to think about all the um, stuff, the assemblages that are coming together to actually get this work done. So the particular cases I want to talk about are in response to what often looks like state alert corporate ineptitude, right, or worse. Um, and that's things like, you know, after Fukushima, we saw there was lots of data collected but not shared, right? And the academics are guilty of this, too. You kind of come into this space, you collect some data and leave. And maybe you'll provide that as open data a year down the road, two years after you've published, who knows, right? That's not useful to people on the ground. So in a lot of these cases where we have uh, essentially environmental disasters and people want data, there's not a lot of sources for um, people to go to to get good data. So these citizen science groups are beginning to redress some of that. So I have two cases I want to talk about that I think are both pretty interesting. Um, the first is public lab, uh, and after the BP oil spill, essentially what you saw was this kind of typical lockdown, right, where a corporation has an interest in people not really getting data or seeing the data very easily. So uh, public lab responded to this by building some weather balloons, sending them up, and starting to collect data themselves. So aerial photographs of what was actually going on, how bad the spill was, this sort of thing. So. This group is kind of interesting because it's a hybrid of scientists and citizens working together, um, but really outside of what we would typically think of as uh, you know, academic or corporate or nonprofit organizations. So for a bit of background, um, I'm a rhetorician, but I have a bias towards uh, organizational rhetorics and communications because I was previously a, a faculty member at Purdue and that was my area. But even those sorts of models and structures don't really get at what's going on here. So this is where we'll come back to infrastructures. What's really interesting about the way these um, organizations rhetorically construct themselves is that they're using the discourse of science, the sanctioning of science, to really talk about how data is going to be constructed in these spaces and the utility of that data. So what we're not seeing is sort of just a resistance to what we think of as the scientific orthodoxy, right? It's deploying the scientific orthodoxy in norms of talking about data and data collection for the purposes of actually addressing environmental uh, uh, disasters, really. So the second case is SafeCast. Um, and I'll come back to this at the end, but uh, SafeCast is one of my favorite examples because I think it's one of the best examples of citizen science projects and data collection projects by non-experts that we can find. So SafeCast formed after the disaster at Fukushima Daiichi. And essentially what happened there was, um, hopefully everybody kind of remembers this, you know, we, we had this disaster unfolding. <laughs> folks didn't really know what's going on, and that includes folks like the Nuclear Regulatory Commission in the United States, if you listen to their transcripts and records. <coughs> so this is bad, right? Words like meltdown are being used. People don't know what this means. But we get evacuation zones. So if you remember, you would see on the news these concentric circles saying you shouldn't be in this section. You can maybe be in this section, but you probably shouldn't be. Well, there wasn't a lot of data released to support these uh, mappings. And essentially, what SafeCast did was release some data that they collected after they realized nobody was putting it out there. And they showed that some of the exclusion zones uh, weren't really all that impacted. And outside of them were too, right? So it was really important to have this data early on and share this data publicly. Now you might be wondering, who are these people? So they're, um, some of them are Bay Area VC types, right? So they have some money and backing to get this going. Uh, Joe Aito, who's the director of the MIT Media Lab, is involved. And uh, otherwise, some people on the ground uh, who were friends of these people. So it sort of formed out of this group of friends, this network of friends. None of them are experts in uh, nuclear dispersion, nuclear energy, or uh, kind of crisis response. But it, uh, what you see here is an actual mapping of their data over time. And they have the largest data set of radiation contamination in the region 
and it's been used by prefectural government and many other organizations. Uh, and they did this all, I deleted the slide for the sake of time, uh, in these tiny little devices that they built and designed themselves to account for not having enough guider counters. So then they drove around and collected this data and they had a bunch of people do that with them. And when they went to shows where other people were trying to figure out mobile detection, they had trailers that were a million bucks to do this with instead, right? So SafeGuest had this great solution for data collection and sharing. And it's all released under a CCO, uh, which is a Creative Commons dedication putting data in the public domain. So then SafeCast has continued their work and they're starting to move into air quality monitoring. Um, and this is their response to some of the challenges the American EPA has faced. That's the Environmental Protection Agency. So hopefully everyone's vaguely familiar with what has been going on. <laughs> okay, I will take that as an affirmative. Yes, so, uh, and this is where I lost all objectivity in studying SafeCast, I'll admit. So if you can't quite see this, they say, in a time when facts have been approved by public, Facts have to be approved by politicians before publication. We are providing alternatives. In a time when ignoring scientific data in favor of partisan political opinion has become the norm, we are pushing back. In a time when government, when government has abandoned its responsibility, responsibility to environment, we are the resistance. Right? This is great. So, so they're basically saying, you know, we've been hard on the EPA before, saying, yeah, you release the data, but is it usable, right? Can people actually access this in a useful way? No. Uh, but now they're saying, come join us, right? We can do this together. So when we can't even trust our governments to give us the data we need, we can actually do this outside of their purview. Uh, and some of this, of course, is all tied to SafeCast designed some of their devices in hacker spaces around the world, right? So you see sort of that ethic coming through, which we don't really need this sanctioning and authorizing. Okay, so what does this matter? Well, we've got the infrastructure stuff, right? So we can see how citizen science broadly covers all these different areas. So it's not really just a community of practice or a discourse community or a particular social network, right? There's something else bigger going on here. And I think some of what it is is, um, you know, we're drawing on these material affordances, right? These previous networks, these other people, this kind of expertise, and all of this is coming together to sort of uh, create these inf information infrastructures that we can really talk about as opposed to these sort of smaller structural units that are composing what citizen science is. Um, so all of this allows these groups to share public knowledge in really interesting ways and that's through the construction of these data commons, right? So shared open data repositories that aren't just, uh, you know, a pile of data but really contextualized in interesting ways. So. Part of the challenge for all of these groups is how do we begin to think about the, uh, not just collecting the data, but understanding the data we're collecting because we're not experts, so we're not taking for granted all of this stuff. Um, and then how do we make it useful for people like us, right? So everyday folks who just want to look at, does my area have an elevated level of whatever they're measuring? And then, of course, um, all of this addresses some of the major educational challenges we have in sort of the realms where I dwell, like science communication or technical communication, which is how do we begin to think not just about deficit model, if we can just tell people stuff, how will they come over to our side and build consensus, but how do we actually begin to think about uh, dealing with all these scientific and technical matters in kind of sophisticated ways where publics are actually informed and can have an opinion and bring their expertise. And okay, so this is where I say, you know, maybe it's it's uh, it's a useful metaphor, and right, I'm a rendition, so of course this is not going to know this. But um, you know, we have these ideas of citizen science has been talked about as social networks, right, of actors or some of this sort of stuff. Also methods, right? So citizen science is a method, scientists like that. Um, but you know, if if we sort of use this infrastructure metaphor, we can get at some of these technical affordances, the expert systems, the materialities, and addition to sort of the knowledge construction processes, and we also get at sort of interesting changes that are occurring in how we think about expertise and knowledge production, and all of these more abstract qualities. And so this is where I say I lose objectivity. Mm -hmm. SafeCast recently um, has relaunched a Kickstarter campaign for their project, and uh, given how much time I've spent researching them, I wanted to plug them shamelessly. So if you're interested in this kind of project, it's definitely worth looking at on Kickstarter. And that's it. Thank you.